those Bibles out. Get them open. You know, we are better when we praise together. We're better when we study together. We're better when we grow together. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what age or stage of life you may be in. I, I don't necessarily know what your praises or your problems may be. But I want you to read this verse with me with the understanding that this is God-breathed. God wrote it. Paul wrote it down. But the promises we see here in Ephesians 3 are tried and true. They are abundant and they are beautiful. And I want us to really learn these verses because I will guarantee you if you will hide these words in your heart, there will be a day when God through the Holy Spirit will bring them back to your mind and the Spirit will whisper to you, you see, God's got this. It's okay. Ask my child. Ask believing. Tell me what you need. Let's say it together. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Ready? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Aren't those great words? God is able to do far more than we can even fathom. And it's according to the power in us because it's according to the person in us, the Holy Spirit. And you know, it's not just for this generation, but for all generations, forever and ever. Today, I believe there's somebody here, and God wants to turn your discouragement into delight. Our God is still in the business of taking tragedy and turning it into triumph. But so often we can't seem to come to God with holy boldness, with an audacity that the Bible calls for, because I believe there's very much a scale. Some people seem to be so confident and daring in their faith. Man, they'll try anything. They'll attack hell with a squirt gun. Come on, put me in the game, coach. I'm ready. And some people just seem to, they, don't, they may know Jesus, but they just seem to walk in discouragement. Sort of a woe is me mentality. Paul, by his own life story, is trying to tell the believers in and around Ephesus, God's got this. Come boldly to God's throne. Look at my life. Look at my testimony. Look at where I am and what I've been through. God will take care of you no matter what you are facing. So I hope some of you really do lead today inspired and encouraged by the truth of God's Word. Would you stand with me as we read that word together? Ephesians 3, 8 to 13. In reality, 8, 9, 10, and 11 are really review. That's really sort of just Paul reviewing where he's been. What we're going to really do is do a quick review of those and then just settle in to 12 and 13 today. Verse 8. To me, Paul, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. To the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in Christ we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is for your glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this word. We know that every part and piece is total truth. So I pray that your spirit would have freedom to, to move in every heart, in every family, in every circumstance, in situation today, and that we would leave changed, more like Christ when we leave this place than when we came. I pray that those who may not know him personally just yet may come even in this hour to trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And for many of us that do know Christ as Savior and Lord, that this would be a time when our batteries are recharged, when our confidence is restored and rebuilt, when we become daring in our faith. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and be seated. So let's do some review. We're going to see two blessings. Two blessings that God gives the church. That means people throughout all the ages and all times and all places that have said yes to Jesus. Two blessings that God gives to and through the church. But before we get there, what is he saying in these opening verses? Well, let's look at how Paul describes himself in verse 8. He wants you to be bold. He wants you to come to God daring. He wants you to come with great confidence, but don't do it arrogantly. Paul says, verse 8, to me who am less than the least of all the saints. Paul remembered who he was. He said, don't put your holy nose up in the air. Don't give me that holier than thou stuff. He said, look, I had an encounter with the living Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. I have never been the same. He said, but I am the least among you. Paul in other places would even call himself chief among sinners. And so he said, God has called me to preach among the Gentiles. Now remember, Paul's a Jew. But he said, God called me to reach the non-Jew, the Gentile, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unfathomable. You can't possibly comprehend how good you've got it in Christ. I know the world sometimes doesn't look that way. I know life sometimes gives you a whole bunch of lemons and things look sour. And yet Paul is saying these riches are indescribable. He says he's, he wants all people to see. Verse 9, what is the fellowship of the mystery? All people. Red and yellow, black and white, Jew and Gentile, male and female, poor and rich, and all of the gamut. He wants all people to see the oikonomia, the economy. Remember that word last week? The stewardship. God entrusted by his grace. Message. I am now proclaiming that. Of course, he's doing it here in writing, but Paul did it verbally as well. I am sharing with you this message because God gave me this mystery that he actually called all people. I know that that was hidden. I know that people didn't get that. See, the Jews thought we're the chosen people of God. And God will be our God and we will be his people and we will be a special nation. And all that's true, by the way. But then God said, look, it's been my plan all along to include all people in this promise. All people can have Jesus as their Messiah. Jesus saves all people that will come to him by grace through faith. And so Paul is saying all of that's revealed now. It's in the manifold, verse 10, the manifold wisdom of God is made known by the church. How does the world know this plan? How does the world know that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised the third day, and only by faith in him can we see God one day? How will the church know that? Paul said it's by the church. How will the world know that? By the church. We are commissioned. We are called to go forth and share in word and in deed and in love to tell people, and I love this word, manifold, by the manifold wisdom of God. Manifold, another way to translate the Greek word is variegated. Another way to translate it, multifaceted. Another way to translate it, multicolored. It's a beautiful word. It means this. God's wisdom has a lot of parts and pieces. And while you think you've got him figured out, the reality is he's much bigger. We have a multifaceted variegated God, a God who is multicolored, who has great variety. And I love that because I like variety. I'm not the guy that can eat the same thing over and over. In fact, one of the challenges I have at my house is I don't do leftovers very well. If I've eaten it, I don't want to eat it again. That's just the truth. It might be delicious, but I'm going to let my children enjoy it a second or third time. I like variety. I don't like the same things. I know guys, I used to go hunting with a group of boys. Every single, it's turkey season, y'all. Praise God, hallelujah. So I'd go turkey hunting with these guys or deer hunting with these guys. And we'd go to these little cafes in our town and they would get the same thing over and over and over. In fact, they'd walk in and the waitress would bring them their coffee and never ask them what they wanted. She'd just bring them the same old thing over and and over. I'm like, Lord, help. We need some variety. You know, churches, though, churches start to look the same way. There's no expectation. There's no excitement. It's going to be the same old thing with the same old songs and the same old people. No offense, but, you know, the same old people in the same old pews doing the same old thing. Well, this is not the same old God. Folks, this is the Creator who loves you. And His mercies are new every 
morning. He is a multifaceted, multicolored, variegated God. And in his wisdom, he's made his plan known. In time past, it wasn't known even according to verse 10 and 11, even to the principalities in heavenly places. They didn't even understand the plan of God. But now by the church, God's plan, what is his plan? That all people can be saved if they'll just come to Jesus. Anybody can have eternal life. Anybody can have abundant life, including you, if you just come to Jesus. So what does that do for us? Two things. Number one. Understanding God's plan gives believers confidence to come to God. Oh, it's up there. Well, that's different. Okay, that's fine. Understanding God's plan gives us confidence to come to God. Now, notice what I said. I chose the words very carefully. Who gets this confidence? Just anybody? Understanding God's plan gives believers. Those that know Jesus. See, you're not going to really confidently approach God unless you know that you have a relationship with God. In Christ, verse 12 says, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. Now let's break those words down. Boldness, parousia. It means we have an openness, a frankness, a freedom in speech. Do you know in our country right now, even the very First Amendment is under attack. Y'all know what that is, right? Freedom of speech. But freedom of speech did not originate with the United States Constitution. Did you know that? Freedom of speech originated with God himself, and it was proven through the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to be able to speak your mind? Then you come to God through Christ, and you have freedom to speak. That is actually what the language here means. We have boldness. Now, I chose the word daring. For the title, Daring or Discouraged, because of some of the definitions I found for daring. Not only does daring mean bold, but it means it has the idea of showing bravery, a fearlessness. I love this definition of daring. Adventurous courage. I can have adventurous courage when I come to God. You say, Pastor, how? Because of the next word, access. I have access. The word in Greek means the right to enter, not based on merit, but it has been given by another. Look back with me at Ephesians 2.18. If you have your Bible open or your device, it says, For through him, through Jesus, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit to the Father. Same word in the Greek, access. We have an openness. So I just wrote it this way. Our access to God comes by faith in Christ alone. Our access to God comes by faith. That was pretty good. That was good time. Comes by faith in Christ alone. Jesus said in John 8, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You will have freedom only in Christ. You have boldness, you have access, and confidence. That word means reliance and trust Every person who comes to Christ in faith now has access to Creator God at any time with boldness, with confidence, and it is the privilege for us to proclaim that to a watching world. I want you to consider what Hebrews 4 says, talking about Jesus. It says, we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses. He is in all points tempted as we are. You know this. Jesus faced every form of temptation. Now, not specifically like yours. He didn't have computers, for instance, but the types of temptation. And yet the Bible says he never sinned. But now look at this. Because he was perfect, therefore, what can we do? We come boldly. ESV translation, English Standard Version says we come confidently to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace. In what time? our time of need. When we need something, when we have hurts that need helping and healing, we come confidently, boldly. We have full access. Confident access knows no fear of rejection. It's not like when you're 16 or 17 years old, guys, and you got to ask that pretty girl to the prom, 
and you're scared out of your gourd, and your hands are sweating, and you don't know what... I know some of y'all looking at me like that never happened. You're not all that studly, boys. I'm looking at y'all, okay? At least this side. Studs are here. No, I'm just kidding. So look, here's the reality. You don't know her answer. Now, I'm assuming maybe she's not your longtime girlfriend. You don't know her answer, so you're nervous. You have no confidence, and you're kind of mumbling and stumbling. Hey, you know, I was going to the dance, and I thought maybe you... And you don't know what she's going to say, but what if you knew there was a guarantee? I knew there was a guarantee with Cindy because she couldn't take her eyes off me, brother. I'm telling you. I'm just kidding. Well, I knew she had to have me. I'm a lucky girl. So she... But what if you have no confidence? Well, see, when it comes to going to God, you have confidence because there's perfect access. There's security. Y'all remember Charles Schultz? You heard that name? Charles M. Schultz. He's famous as creator of the Peanuts comic strip and all those great characters. Schultz is credited with many things. One of the phrases he's often given credit for, and some say it was around before this, but he's given credit for the phrase security blanket. Anybody want to take a wager as to why? There was a character that always carried a blanket. What was his name? Good, Linus. Did anybody notice that that blanket was Carolina blue, God's favorite color? Praise the Lord Jesus. Did you notice that? Linus always carried that little blanket around. And so that was his security blanket. Some of you had things like that. For me, I had a security Papa Smurf. Y'all might not remember that show, but for years and years and years, I slept with the Papa Smurf. And when we got married, she said, you need to get rid of that thing. And I said, okay. Okay. So I had a Papa Smurf. But, you, you know, kids get security items. Well, listen, it's not just kids. Some of y'all have a security blanket. What's it for you? Do you have one? Is it your money? Is it your money? Is it your health? Is it the way you look? Maybe your home. Could be your spouse. Could be your children. Maybe you're kind of living vicariously through them. Let me tell you why none of those make a good security blanket. Everything I just mentioned, money, even spouse, even, heaven forbid, children, can be taken. Just like that. It's just like that. Some of you have experienced it. Let me tell you why Cindy Lewis cannot be my security blanket. Because one day Cindy and I will part. We even vowed till death do us part. Now we'll see one another again. But my security can't be in Cindy. My security must be in Christ. You follow me? Your security must be in the Lord Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than what? Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Why? All other ground is what? Sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. You must have security in Jesus because everything else, your money can fail you. Your health can fail you. My friend, 2008, one of the boys I grew up playing baseball with, I got a phone call. He said, Bobby, please come. Help me. Help me. I said, what is going on? He said, it's my daddy. His daddy was hanging from a tree limb in the backyard because when the economy tanked, his daddy had a security blanket and it was called his checkbook and his stock account. You follow what I'm saying? Those things change. Only Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You have security in him. He paid the price for sin. But not everybody gets that. Think about old Job. Job said in Job 9.2 and following, How can a man be righteous before God? If one wished to contend with him, he couldn't answer him even one time out of a thousand. Job had lost everything except his mean, ornery wife. He had lost it all. Job said later in that chapter, God's not a man as I am, that I can answer him and that we should go to court together. Now look what Job didn't know. Look what Job didn't know. He said there's no mediator between us. There's no body like a lawyer standing before a judge that can have his hand on me and his hand on God. Oh, that there would be somebody that could be a both and for us. Look what Job said. Let him take his rod away from me. Do not let dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him. 
If God would take these things away and just give me a mediator. Well, later in the book, if you keep reading, Job realized his Redeemer lives. <laughs> he realized that there was a mediator. He was looking way ahead to Jesus. But this is a long time before Christ would come to the earth. Looking back, here's what you and I know. There is a mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ, who has his hand on us because he's one of us. And he has his hand on God because he's fully God. You say, Pastor, how is that possible? Ask him when you get there, man. He's God. You take it by faith. He's fully man. He's fully God. He's the perfect mediator, and he gives me access. Now, if you haven't figured it out just yet, sometimes I can talk fast, so hang on because i got a lot to say. Something I read years and years ago that I typed up from a study Bible, and every statement I'm about to make, I have scripture references beside of it. I want you to get some confidence back today. Some of you need a confidence booster today. You don't need a self-esteem booster. You need a God-esteem booster. Let me talk to you for a minute about Jesus. One of the great tenets of Scripture is the claim that Jesus Christ is completely sufficient for all matters of life and godliness. He is sufficient for creation, salvation, sanctification, and glorification. He is so pure that there's no blemish, stain, spot of sin, defilement, lying, deception, corruption, error, or imperfection in Christ. He is so complete there is no other God besides him. He is the only begotten Son. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in him, and the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in him. Christ is heir of all things. He created all things, for all things were made by him, through him, and for him. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He is the firstborn of all creation, the exact representation of God. Jesus alone is the only mediator between God and man. He is the sun that enlightens, the physician that heals, the wall of fire that defends, the friend that comforts, the pearl that enriches, the ark that supports, the rock to sustain us under the heaviest of pressures. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. He is better than the angels. He is better than Moses. He is better than Aaron. He is better than Melchizedek. He is better than all the prophets. He is greater than Satan and stronger than death. Christ has no beginning and no ending. He is the spotless Lamb of God, our peace, our hope, our life, our living in true way, the strength of Israel, the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. He is our faithful and true witness, the author and finisher of our faith, the captain of our salvation, our champion, elect one, apostle, and high priest of our confession. He is a righteous servant. He is Lord of hosts, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, the man of sorrows, the light, the son of man, the vine, the bread of life, the door, our Lord. He is prophet, priest, and king, our Sabbath rest, our righteousness. He is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, the chief shepherd, Lord God of hosts, Lord of all nations, lion of Judah, living word, rock of salvation, eternal spirit, ancient of days, creator and comforter and Messiah, and the Lord Jesus is the great I am. <laughs> And man, if that doesn't give you confidence, I don't know what else is going to. And that list is not even exhaustive. There's more in the Bible. But I gave you a pretty good run through. Do you have confidence to approach God today? Listen to me. Listen to me. Not arrogantly. Confidently. There's a huge difference between being cocky and being confident. And Paul said, I am confident, but I am the least of all the saints. Understanding God's plan gives us confidence to come to God. And finally, understanding God's plan gives us courage to face difficult circumstances. Because of that confident access Paul had, he said, Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart. Don't lose heart at my tribulations for you. It's for your glory. Don't be discouraged. Lose heart. That's what it means. Don't faint. Now, why did Paul say don't be discouraged? Don't lose heart. Well, where's he writing from? Always got to set the text in context. Where's he writing from, church? Prison. It is a prison epistle. He is an arrest. In Rome, he writes four of his letters there. Isn't that just like God to slow Paul down long enough to write these letters? Isn't that just like God? He said, I'm all right. 
This will come out okay for you. It'll even come out okay for me. But he's facing tribulation. He said, don't lose heart at my tribulation. Another verse has the exact flipsis as the Greek. is an exact same word, John 16, 33. What did Jesus say in John 16, 33? These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have, same word, tribulation. Maybe Jesus? Is it a possibility, Jesus? No. Follower of Christ, it's a guarantee. Live long enough, and in this world you will have tribulation. Then Jesus says, be of good cheer. I love that verse, man. I love that verse. I've overcome the world. God in his sovereignty calmed Paul down and set him down long enough in house arrest in prison of Rome to say, I need you to write these letters to my people in and around Ephesus and in and around Philippi and in and around Colossae, and I need you to write another letter to a fellow named Philemon. And these are the prison epistles. And I, even in his tribulation, they're for the glory of God. Remember Romans 8, 28? Y'all know that verse? We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Those are called according to his purpose. Y'all know that verse? Do you know the context of that verse? Romans 8. Look, look at 10 verses earlier. Look at 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be, be compared to the glory which will be revealed. Did you know the context of Romans 8, 28 is suffering? Christians often want to quote Romans 8, 28. In fact, I was praying one night in a midweek prayer service. I had just gotten onto my first staff 20 years ago. I was a staff guy. I did worship ministry and some other things for four years. And I prayed, Lord, thank you that all things work together for good. And I kept praying. And my pastor pulled me aside. My senior pastor pulled me aside after the meeting. And he said, Bobby, I just want to help you with something. Don't ever pray only part of that verse. I'm so glad he told me that. Because the Bible doesn't say, we know that all things work together for good. It doesn't say that. We know that all things work together for good for a specific group under specific circumstances. We know all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and those who are called or the called according to Him. According to Him. That means this. Well, I'll drink and I can get behind the wheel and I'm, God will be... No, God doesn't work that out for good. Because you're not walking in the path He laid for you. See, you can't just go live and act like a heathen and expect it to be okay. Because somehow, years and years ago, you walked an aisle, signed a card, and went through a baptistry. That's not the way this thing called the Christian life works. In the context of suffering, if you want to claim that verse, Lord, you're going to work this together for good. Because I love you and I'm called according to your purpose. If you're going to claim it, it's going to be in the context of suffering. I would ask you, do you ever feel discouraged? Do you ever lose heart? Do you ever wish that, man, things were just different? Well, if you've lived long enough, of course you answered yes. Would you write this down? In the difficult circumstances, I want you to replace your current questions of why. God won't often give you the why. God, why did my daddy get Alzheimer's? Why did my son get this disease? Why, why did... We lose so many so soon. Why did that happen to me? God, why'd you close that door? Lord, why didn't I get that fill in the blank? Why don't you change that to what? What are you wanting to teach me? God, how can this be used for your glory and the good of others? Man, I, I was first pastorate after I'd been on staff four years. I took my first senior role not long into that. 26-year-old tried to kill his mother, tried to kill his father. He did not succeed, but he did play Russian roulette and, and was able to kill himself. And I was asked by the family to do his service. I'd never done anything like that. I talked to them about, they, in fact, we, they said most of the people that would come, the type of friends he had, would have never been in a church before. So I asked him about sharing the gospel. And then I asked him to even one step further, could I give an invitation? And I, would make it, I wouldn't make it awkward. We give people an opportunity to respond to the truth because God could still bring life from death. And they said, yes, we'd actually like for you to do that. And so, you know, th here's this young man, had all of life ahead of him, just kind of eaten up with evil. But he tragically took his life. 
But when I shared the hope that we could have in Christ, that these other people that were sitting in front of me, it wasn't a huge, a, a big funeral. Believe me, there were not a lot of people in attendance. But you could definitely see the ones that had likely never darkened the door of a church. When we just shared the truth in love, do you know that day, 26 of his young friends trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? Do you know that? 26. See, you may not understand the why behind why tragedies like that happen. But God, how can this be used for your glory and the good of others? Too often, though, our courage is misplaced. It's like the lady and her husband. They interrupted their vacation to go to the dentist. The lady came in. Boy, she was hot. When the dentist came by, she said, Hey, I want this tooth pulled. I don't want Novocaine because I'm in a big hurry. She said, Just get this tooth out as quick as you can and we'll be on our way. Well, the dentist was surprised, and he was actually impressed. He said, well, you're, you're a very courageous woman. Which tooth is it? She looked at her husband. She said, turn your head, honey. Let him see which tooth it is. <laughs> Isn't it easier to have courage for other people than yourself? I'm, t I'm being honest. Can't, isn't it easier sometimes to pray more courageously for others? God, I know we've heard cancer, but we believe you're going to heal them. I thank you that you can touch them and take things. And you pray that believing it, don't you? But what about when the doctor tells you it's cancer? Right? Where's your courage then? Where's your holy boldness? Your audacious courage to come before God and say, God, I believe you can touch. I am your child. I come to you boldly through Christ. See, Paul not only taught the talk, Paul walked the walk. He could say, don't lose heart. I know I'm in prison, but it's going to be okay. God's got this. How could Paul say that? Y'all remember a story from Acts 16? It happened before this. Remember that story? Paul and Silas are in a prison, praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Anybody remember what happened next? There's a great earthquake. It shook the prison so much so that what happened to the prison door? <laughs> Swung open. Why didn't Paul and Silas run out? They didn't need to. The God had taken them that far. Philippian jailer was about to take his own life. He knew if any prisoners escaped that it would be his head anyway. He figured I'll just take care of it myself. He saw those boys didn't run. He saw they were still praising God. You know what he did? He came in and he fell down and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household, and you'll be saved. You know what he did? He gave his life to Jesus. And his family members gave their life to Jesus. Why were old Paul and Silas in that jail? Why were they singing hymns? Could have been so that Philippian jailer and his crew could come to Jesus Christ. Paul knew God took care of me before. God will take care of me again. Hey, church, don't lose heart. Don't get downtrodden. God's got this. You start listening to the news too much, you start looking online too much and believing the press, you'll think that everything's falling apart. No, friend, our God wins in the end. Team Jesus is a victorious team every time. You can think, well, man, the church is losing it and people are leaving and doing this and the other. Listen, my God's got this, and i got to make a choice. Am I going to look at my storms, or am I going to look at my Savior? See, understanding God's plan gives us confidence to come to God. And understanding God's plan gives believers courage to face difficult circumstances. I'm going to ask you a question. It's not a trick question. Which is bigger, a quarter or the sun, S-U-N. Which is bigger? Yeah, I can't believe how many people don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Would we all agree that the sun is bigger than the quarter? Okay. Thank you so much. You think I'm going to do a bait and switch. I'm not. The sun is a lot bigger than the quarter. Not a hundred times bigger or a thousand times bigger. It's, I can't even describe to you how much bigger it is infinitesimally bigger than the quarter. But I would also argue that this quarter can block out the entire sun, right? Yeah. At least from my point of view. I mean, all I got to do, just like those bright lights up there, I just cover an eye and I hold this up and I get it. Please don't try this at home later. 
And I look to the sun, and I just put this thing up, and I hold it close enough, and boom, everything goes dark. Now, please hear my heart. I'm not trying to belittle your problems, your issues, your grief. They're as real as this quarter. Man, this is real. This was minted by the U.S. government. It's real. I mean, it's the real deal. Your problems are real. But the sun is so, so, so much bigger than this quarter. And yet this little quarter can block it out entirely from your view. Our God is so much bigger than your problems. But what are you focused on today? Because whatever you focus on is what's going to be in your view. And your problems, if you're not careful, held too close, can block out even the light of the S-U-N. Or the S-O. Some of you may feel like you're walking in darkness. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Some of you feel like all you've got are problems. By the authority of the inerrant word of God, I guarantee you, if you will sit down, be still before God, consider your blessings versus your burdens, your blessings will always outweigh them. 10, 20, 100 to 1. I know sometimes it feels like that's all you can see. But I'm asking you today to put that stuff away. I'm asking you today to come confidently to God and choose to look at the Savior more than the storm. I'm asking you today to make a choice. What are you going to be in this faith walk? Are you going to be daring or are you going to be discouraged? Stand with me this morning. This is your choice. Your choice. God is offering all the resources of heaven, all the peace that you can imagine from the Prince of Peace, all the joy that you could possibly stand from the joy giver, Jesus himself. You have to take him at his word. You have to trust that he's not finished with you yet. You're on the journey. God's got a plan for you. You said, Pastor, how can you be so confident in that? Man, to me, it's very simple. You were able to stand. You're breathing. Heart's beating. Most of you are looking at me and not playing Fortnite or whatever. Look, that's fantastic. You got it. Because you're still here, God's still working on you. Remember the little children's songs? One of the first ones I ever sang in church when I was a little dude. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. I can't believe I remember those lyrics. That's incredible. That's got to be a God thing. It's been 35 years. Some of you need to come to him in faith today and trust him for the first time. The promises delivered were not for you until you say yes to Jesus. You can't have bold access to God. You can't even get to God. God does not hear the, pr the prayers of the unrighteous. Did you know that? Don't let that be a shocker to you. Reread the Psalms. If you regard iniquity in your heart, your prayer stops at the ceiling, so to speak. You're not going to have access to God apart from Jesus. He's the only mediator. But the moment you do trust Christ, he hears that prayer of repentance and then everything thereafter. So some of you need to trust Christ today. People will be here ready. Pastors, counselors will be ready to help you. How do I trust Christ? Well, we'll show you. Some of you need to come back. Man, you have got a pocket full of quarters, and that's all you can see. I'm not saying they're not real. They're real. 
But like someone told me between services, are you going to keep telling God how big your problems are? Or are you ready to tell your problems how big your God is? What's it going to be? It's a choice. It's always a choice. Some of y'all need to come and join the church today. We've dated a long time. Come on and marry us. We say, I do. Some people up there today said they're getting married. It was really funny. It was great. In the new member's class, you said, well, I'm not in the class. That's okay. Take the next step and come say, I know you're going to preach the truth, sing the truth, live the truth. I want to be here. Great. We welcome you. Come on. Some of you just need to come and be a prayer warrior for you or someone you know and love. You know somebody that's very, very discouraged right now, that's very downtrodden, that may be close to the end of that rope. You need to ask God to give them a new rope. And you need to let them trust through you. Just like Jesus saw their faith, the men lowering the paralytic, and he healed the man through their faith. You need to have that faith for someone today. When I say amen, the altar will be open. Father in heaven, words are inadequate. There are not enough words in the English language. There's not enough passion that could be pent up in my bones to express the confidence that we can have in Christ. Paul articulated it by the Holy Spirit in a perfect way. And help us to take the perfect word and to apply it so that we might experience perfect peace. It doesn't mean the tribulations won't come, but it means you give us a supernatural ability to keep walking. We cannot do it alone. We need Christ and Christ alone. So move us now to respond to this truth in Jesus' name.